Europe will be torn between its head and its heart on the US-China question. It was the rise of Athens and the fear that this instilled in Sparta that made war inevitable. Any student of international relations should recognise this quote from the Peloponnesian War written 24 centuries ago by the great historian Thucydides. It describes the natural tension that arises when an emerging power is on the verge of overtaking the established power, a situation that often leads to conflict. So, just like Sparta and Athens look to their allies to gain a strategic edge over their rival, the United States and China, locked in their great power struggle, have their eyes set on Europe. Only last December, major tensions flared up across the Atlantic over the CAI investment agreement reached between the European Commission and China. Europe is thus, once again, a geopolitical playing field, but it remains to be seen if it can be a geopolitical actor on its own right. Where should Europeans stand in this great power conflict between the US, the historic democratic ally across the Atlantic, and China, the EU's main trading partner? And could this be an opportunity for Europe to build its own strategic autonomy? To answer those questions, we have with us two seasoned diplomats and scholars, former French Foreign Minister Hubert Védrine and former Singaporean Ambassador Kishore Mababani. But before we go, and common decency needs you. If you find this show interesting and happen to like us enough to come back every week, we would love your support. You can really help us a ton by doing small things like subscribing, writing a review, or even sharing the show with a friend you think would be a great match for Uncommon Decency. Now, on to the show. We are so glad to have with us, for this conversation, two distinguished diplomats and authors. On one side of the line, we have Kishore Mababani. He's a veteran Singaporean diplomat and served as president of the United Nations Security Council from 2001 to 2002. He's currently a distinguished fellow at the Asia Research Center at the National University of Singapore and a prolific author with bestsellers such as Can Asians Think? Understanding the Divide Between East and West. And your latest from 2020, Has China Won? The Chinese Challenge to American Primacy. On the other side of the line, we have Hubert Védrine from France. He's a former diplomatic advisor to late President Mitterrand and a former Minister of Foreign Affairs from 1997 to 2002. He's an important thinker of foreign policy in the European landscape, and we owe him concepts like that of the American hyperpower. He's an equally prolific author, and he just recently, uh, re recently released Dictionnaire Amoureux de la Géopolitique and wrote the preface of a French edition of Professor Mababani, Has China Won? Thank you so much to the both of you for coming on Common Decency for what I hope should be an important conversation for how Europeans should handle the Sino-American rivalry. Before we begin determining a strategy for Europe, I think it is important to identify the key motivations of these two great powers. Let's begin with China. Is China a revisionist state which would be comparable to the USSR in the early Cold War? Does China seek to impose its model internationally and perhaps should Europeans accept that we are reaching the end of a Western dominated parenthesis of history and adapt accordingly, Professor Mambani? Well, I thank you very much for inviting me and I want to thank Mr. Minister Vedrin for writing the preface to my book as China One. It was a great privilege and honor. Uh, I would say China is not a revisionist state. China's political behavior is conditioned by 4,000 years of Chinese history. And the Chinese political culture, the one thing the Chinese fear the most is chaos. Or there's a Chinese word for it, Luan. And so the, what the Chinese cherish after having suffered so much strife for thousands of years is order and stability. So if you are China by definition, because of its long history, is a status quo power that is going to try and preserve stability as much as possible. And the Chinese will not try to re in any way 
change the world order that the West has gifted to us since 1945. Um, Professor Vedrin, on this concept of the uh, Western parenthesis of history, how do you think about the rise of China and the way we should react to it? Um, the two differences between China and the West, of course, I'm using the West in not as rigorous a meaning, but you know what I mean. Um, first of all, there is um, th this vision, as, as Professor Mabubani has said, that um, China has had this long history behind it. Uh, the 4,000 years we're talking about are maybe a little bit formulaic, but what it means is that they have time on their side. They're not harassed every day. They can take the time to think. They don't have to deal with um, political social networks and constant on ongoing information and therefore they can think as before um, the way Europe did manage before um, the current era. Okay. Alors, ma deuxième remarque, c'est que l'Occident est, est fondamentalement prosélyte. Um, the West is fundamentally based on proselytism. Uh, it is obviously steeped in Christianism, even evangelization. Um, even if uh, many people are not necessarily religious, it, it is permeating the, the way of thinking, um, which gives rise to a vision that is almost missionary of their role. Um, and of course, there is this mix of their own interest and their mission, which is converting others, which can, of course, be antagonistic. Um, this this works well when the West is in a position of domination, but it cannot work when uh, there is no longer this monopoly on domination. Um, obviously, if we look at the US, their calendar is very short term. We look at the mandate of obviously the president, but if you think about it, there will be the midterm elections in only one year, and China knows that. Um, Obviously, whether the intention of both is a specific coexistence or dominion or one or the other uh, remains to, 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 to be decided. But China knows, and China has this superiority because it knows of the short term calendar of the West. la coexistence specifique ou alors de sa volonté, il y a un élément qui me paraît un élément de supériorité du côté chinois. Ils connaissent le calendrier étroit dans lequel les dirigeants occidentaux sont enfermés. Ils ont d'autres faiblesses, mais ils ont cet atout. I actually, I, I, I must say, uh, I completely agree uh, with the two points uh, made by uh, Minister Vedrin. Uh, the Chinese sense of time is very different from the Western sense of time. And, uh, you know, so they've, uh, I mean, just give, give you one simple example. We, we are, the world is suffering from COVID-19, it's a shock to the world. But the Chinese have actually kept very detailed records of 350 pandemics throughout Chinese history. <laughs> so for them, a pandemic is nothing new. We've had it mm. 350 times. And similarly, when Minister Vedrin spoke about the short-term horizon of uh, the West, I mean, that's seriously, is going to become a major structural challenge uh, between uh, certainly China and the United States, because in this big contest that has broken up between US and China, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping is looking where, where the world will be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. Joe Biden is only worried about the midterm elections in 2022, because if he loses the midterm elections, he's in trouble. So you can see if China plays the long game and United States plays the short game, China has a competitive advantage. Great. Uh, well, move, moving on to, to the second question, and, and this this was a, a very um, a, a very good way to, to kind of set up the tables of the conversation by by outlining these uh, uh, core differences in the strategic uh, thinking of, of the, the West and, and China and. and and if we try to zero in on, on Europe's role in this, this uh, looming rivalry, I, I, I uh, was hoping we could get perhaps a, a, some comment from, uh, from both of you on, on how you see Europe's role in this, in this uh, geopolitical landscape. Do you, do you think you know, there's, there's a growing debate in, in Brussels and Europe, European capitals about you know, what uh, role Europe should play and that, it, and that it should play a role and that it, uh, it should play a, um, a singular role of its own that, that it, it sets 
according to its own uh, uh, principles and interests and, and values. And uh, this is what President Emmanuel Macron has termed strategic autonomy. And, and on, the, on the other side of that debate, there's uh, some, some people who are persuaded that, uh, that in fact not, that Europe should, uh, should still tuck uh, towards the, the sort of the North Atlantic um, uh, uh, matrix of, of foreign policy. And, and I, I was hoping we could get perhaps some comment first by Minister Vedrin on how he sees uh, the challenge for Europe in this, in this growing uh, uh, US-China rivalry, and then, then we'll turn back to, um, to Professor Mabubani. D'abord, quand on parle de l'Europe, c'est toujours délicat, c'est un peu un mot valise. Euh, Est-ce qu'on parle de l'Allemagne, de la France, de l'Italie Est-ce qu'on parle des institutions européennes um, Europe is a bit of a portmanteau word. word. Um, are we talking about institutions or are we talking about countries? Um, but we've got to remember that Europe was not conceived at the time of the Marshall Plan as a strategic actor. Um, and all the efforts that were made for the last 20 or 30 years, especially under French presidents, and namely um, Monsieur Macron, um, to develop the strategic position have not led to much results. Um, obviously, the language has evolved, uh, the intention has evolved, but ultimately there has not been this mental, mental shock among populations that, um, that meant that Europe should indeed become a strategic actor. Uh, instead, there's been a focus on openness, on universal values, uh, but I think this also applies to the Chinese question, because there's been an alignment with the North Atlantic, and in fact, um, there is no way of opposing China's questions. Um, Europe does not have the strength of the ideas. For instance, it did not take advantage um, of the, the Trump era to get stronger and affirm itself. Instead, it waited for the nightmare to end and ended up in a rather comfortable position, um, as exemplified, in fact, by the communications of, the, of NATO. Um, obviously, we see different, um, different interests. For instance, um, Germany has mostly commercial uh, considerations to deal with. Now, after uh, President Biden's trip to Europe, um, which was quite successful in terms of communication with allies and neutralization of the Russian question, um, the Europe um, agreed with the US. Um, however, Europe still has its own interests at heart, but it may not manage to actually express them clearly enough. Um, we will have to see that through their behavior in the, in the, in the near future. Um, that's why I think we need to be very nuanced when we consider their view with regards to the Chinese question. Professor Mabboni? Uh, I think, you know, Europe will be torn between its head and its heart uh, on the US-China question because there's no question that Europe's heart is with the United States, okay? I mean, you share common values, uh, you fought wars together, you fought World War II together, you fought the Cold War together. And, you know, it's at the end of the day, cultural affinity matters so much. And so this, this, out of a sense of cultural solidarity, Europe will be torn and will be brought to say, okay, let's work with the United States in this great contest uh, against uh, China. But at the same time, I think, you know, Europe also, unlike the United States, has had a long history and it knows that it has had troubles uh, in the past. And the most important lesson that I think Europe has learned uh, is that geopolitics is a combination of two words, geography and politics. And geography matters a lot. So for example, the United States doesn't have to worry about the coming demographic explosion in Africa. It makes no difference to the United States. I mean, Africa's population in 1950 was half of Europe's. Today, Africa's population is more than double that of Europe. By 2100, Africa's population will be 10 times that of Europe. So if, if there, there will definitely, there will be a huge, how do you say, uh, I'm gonna find the right words for this, okay? Politically correct words, okay? 
politically correct words to say, there'll be huge floods of Africans coming to Europe unless Africa develops, okay? And so it is in Africa's, in, in, it is in Europe's long-term interest to see more factories, roads, bridges, highways, schools built in Africa, to develop Africa, to create jobs in Africa for the Africans, and that will then prevent the huge floods of Africans coming to Europe. And the biggest investor in Africa today is China. And, and if China invests all these things in Africa, it is actually a, China is giving Europe a geopolitical gift. And you know, there's an old expression in English, never look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> if you get a gift, accept it and take it. And so at the end of the day, I hope that, you know, the Europeans have had long traditions uh, of what I call uh, geopolitical shrewdness, you know? And in, 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 the, in the coming, I must emphasize one thing, and this is something, of course, was a subject of my previous book, Has the West Lost It? The 200 years of Western domination of world history was an aberration, okay? Let's be very, very clear. And I want to emphasize that the 21st century will be very different from the 19th century, it will be very different from the 20th century. The texture and chemistry of the world will be very different. And so if Europe doesn't realize that, if it sticks with its heart, and say, no, no, I'll just go with the United States without thinking about its own interests, then I fear that Europe will be in, in, in trouble. So as, as a friend of Europe, I say, look after your interests. Because at the end of the day, I think the world is better off to see a happy European Union. A happy European Union is a role model for the world. Number one, you have zero wars among European countries. Number two, you have the best societies in the world. Okay, your, your social democratic models, especially the Nordic societies, are the dream of all the world. So a strong, successful European Union that manages its geopolitical affairs shrewdly and remains strong and prosperous is good for the world. And but to do that, you've got to be take a course that is independent of the United States and a course independent of China and be a strategic autonomous actor. Je trouve ça génial d'entendre Kishan Mabubani dire tout ça. It's absolutely wonderful hearing uh, Kishan Mabubani saying this. Um, if only Europeans thought exactly the same, it would be great. Um, Kishan Mabubani expressed uh, the point of view of, of many Europeans, especially French people and French presidents. Um, if now we could spread that view across Europe, that would be great. Voilà, donc il faut répandre les idées de notre ami Babou Bani dans toute l'Europe. Voilà l'idée. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Professor Mahmoud Bani, for these, uh, for these uh, kind words, I guess, for, for, for Europe. Um, I, I want to pivot a little way, a little bit from Europe to the way China and America perceive Europe and it's in the role it should be playing in this geopolitical rivalry. Um, under Trump, it was quite clear there was little thinking on how the United States could best get Europe on its side in its confrontations with China, relying mostly on a mixture of threats and bombast to contain China's influence in Europe. Uh, I think the most striking example in that regard has been the controversies around Huawei and 5G. Biden seeks to better coordinate US policy with European allies. And at the same time, China is building ties across the continent especially in Eastern and South Southern Europe. What role do the Americans and the Chinese expect Europe to play in their geopolitical rivalry? And perhaps can Europe have its cake and eat it by playing both sides against one another in order to maximize its strategic leverage in this rivalry? Uh, Professor Mabibani, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, in, there's no question. <laughs> that Joe Biden is a huge improvement over Donald Trump. Okay, that we should celebrate the fact that Joe Biden was elected. And Donald Trump was hugely destabilizing to the world. I mean, he was such a, a narcissist uh, that, you know, he just was only focused on himself and frankly didn't even care for about America or the world. He was just so much interested in himself. So the election of Joe Biden is a huge improvement. 
But on the US-China question, Joe Biden is actually making the same mistake as Donald Trump, which is that he's carrying on with this geopolitical contest against China without first working out a long-term strategy. And as I say in my book, the man who gave me this insight was Henry Kissinger uh, when I spoke to him uh, when I was doing research for my book. So what the United States needs is, is a credible long-term strategy. And your question was, can Europe have its cake and eat it? Can it play one off against the other? I said, no, don't play one off against the other. I would say appeal to the, uh, their rational long-term self-interest of China and appeal to the rational long-term self-interest of the United States. And in the case of the United States, China is not a threat to the United States. China is not planning an invasion of the United States. China doesn't want to do anything to transform the political system of the United States. But the United States sees it as a threat. But the United States makes a huge mistake in confusing the, the, the desire for primacy with the, the, with the desire to improve the well-being of its people. And the strategic choice that the United States should make is it should take care of its own people and, for, and, and privacy doesn't matter. Because what's happened is that the United States is the only major developed country where the average income of the bottom 50% has been going down over 30 year period. So I want a strong United States. I want a United States that takes care of its people. I want to see a strong self-confident United States. And in the same way, I will also argue that from the Chinese perspective, appeal to the rational self-interest of China and say it is in China's rational self-interest to respect the rules of the multilateral order that were created by the West and especially by Europe and America after World War II. So I say, don't, don't try to take advantage, appeal to the higher self-interest of the United States, appeal to the higher self-interest of China, and then Europe would have played a magnificent role in creating a better world. Alors, d'abord, du point de vue des Américains, ils vont évidemment chercher à ce que les alliés européens soient derrière eux. <coughs> From the point of view of the Americans, they will obviously try to get the EU allies with them. It was very clear uh, during the G7, it was very clear at the NATO conference, they will apply a policy of indignant um, in the, in the um, Indo-Pacific um, world. China knows this and China will act towards each European country and each European institution in order to limit the impact of the United States and highlight in Europe the importance of cooperating with it. L'intérêt de continuer à coopérer avec la Chine. Et donc les Européens vont jouer avec les deux, en fait, entre les deux. And Europe will try is best to play between the two, to be between the two. Um, they cannot and may not agree to play just as Kishore Mabobani has said, but they will try to navigate waters between the two. De naviguer entre les deux. Donc ça, ce n'est pas, pas flamboyant sur le plan conceptuel, mais en pratique, ça se traduira par des dizaines de, de conflits de tensions <clears throat> Obviously, this system is not impressive on the concept front, but it will lead to dozens of conflicts between, say, the US and a given European country, or China and another European country. And we need to see in a year to two years how uh, Europe manages to consolidate its margin of maneuver that would lead it to a second stage and more affirmation. At this point, I see it as impossible. In fact, this, the opposite seems to be happening and uh, Europe is rallying behind the US. It seems very obvious. Um, however, I do hope that um, the, the, the near future will highlight how this margin of maneuver develops and um, how it can create a more intelligent relationship with China. Obviously, that also depends on China's response. And I hope that they will permit to make concrete margins of maneuver that 
qui préfigurerait une relation d'avenir plus intelligente avec la Chine. Mais ça va dépendre aussi des comportements de la Chine, sur les deux ou trois sujets sensibles que tout le monde connaît. Uh, you know, I, I completely agree with what Minister Bedrin said. The, you know, political habits don't change easily. And especially, I would say, uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, after the spectacular victory that the United States had, and after it became, to quote Minister Bedrin's, a uh, hyper puissance. <laughs> Uh, uh, hyperpower. So Europe became naturally deferential towards Washington DC and assumed that in one way or another Washington DC knew what he was doing. But I think it's very important for, for the more sophisticated, I hope, European minds to understand that the best way for Europe to be a good friend of the United States is actually to tell the United States not just what it is doing right, but what it is doing wrong. And you know, from time to time, Europe has done it. I mean, under, under your president, Charles de Gaulle uh, of France, uh, Lee Kuan Yew admired Charles de Gaulle. <laughs> he thought he was one of the greatest leaders. And Charles de Gaulle, even though he, he irritated the uh, Americans a lot, he actually gave them advice that they needed to hear. And, 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 and today, especially, when you can see that the United States may be going off in the wrong direction, the best way that Europe can help the United States is to say, please listen to us, we want to help you. For example, the most recent example I can think of is that when France and Germany tried to persuade President George W. Bush that the invasion of Iraq will be a disaster, France and Germany were absolutely right. The United States has now spent $5 trillion fighting unnecessary wars. And if that $5 trillion had gone to the bottom 50% in America, each American citizen would have received a check for $30,000 at a time when 60% of Americans don't have access to $400 in emergency cash. So the United States has clearly lost its way in a fundamental way. So if, the, if Europe wants to be a good friend to the United States, and, and you don't have to say this uh, publicly, you can say this privately, you can tell the United States that there is a wiser course of action to follow. Instead of going into this headlong clash with, with China, And, you know, I'm coming out with an article in the national interest in a few weeks' time that says, Americans cannot conceive of the possibility that they may lose. Now, I think America has got a good chance of winning, but hey, you may lose. So why don't you think about that? So why doesn't Europe help the United States look at the bigger strategic picture and work out a coherent, long-term, systematic strategy that keeps all the things in place that makes sure that Europe remains strong and prosperous, America remains strong, strong and prosperous, and East Asia remains strong and prosperous. It's possible to work out win-win-win bargains. And that's what I hope European minds will try to do with the United States. Well, it, it seems like uh, the, the main obstacle to um, for, for the Europeans to carve out this, this um, singular role of their own and that the US-China rivalry is, is their own divisions, right? It seems like they, they have a different understanding of where, where Europe should, should, um, should head in this new um, geopolitical landscape. And I, I, I wanted to ask um, Professor Madhubani as an outsider, how he sees, uh, what, whether he sees further integration of foreign policy in Europe as a solution to this. Does, the, does Europe feel disunited in your view and where you see things? Mm -hmm. Well, the big question is whether or not the departure of the United Kingdom will be good or bad for the European Union that remains. And in part, it's bad because the British, whatever you say about them, they're very cunning. They're very, <laughs> never underestimate the British, okay? So you lose a very cunning actor uh, from Europe. But at the same time, I think, If Europe 
uh, can, especially if France and Germany can work together closely and try to figure out what are the natural, rational, long-term interests of Europe. What does Europe want to, where does Europe want to be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, vis-a-vis -vis US, vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis Africa, and so on and so forth. And then once you try to work that out, there is a tremendous geopolitical opportunity for Europe today to play an independent role because that's what the world wants to hear, wants to have in the world. I mean, in theory, India could have done it, but India, unfortunately, sadly, I'm an Indian, is losing its way in, in significant ways. And so there are not many independent actors left in the world. And, and in that sense, I would say that the, the diplomatic or geopolitical opportunity that Europe has today is phenomenal. Uh, but it just has got to, in one way or another, shed the, all the conceptual terminology from the Cold War era and take it out of his brain, wash, his, wash those concepts out of his brain and say, hey, I'm dealing with a different world. Um, Mr. Minister, uh, I, I want to bounce back on this question of European integration because it seems that Europe, the continent of Machiavelli and Bismarck, is no longer capable of thinking in Machiavellian terms and it seems often very naive in the realm of geopolitics with the EU long passing its back for being a vegetarian world of carnivores. Is there a real risk for Europeans not so much choosing the wrong policy in this age of great power competition, but not choosing at all in becoming a geopolitical playing field rather than a geopolitical actor? In other words, can Europe become Machiavellian again? C'est une discussion que j'ai déjà eue avec euh, Kishore Maboubani. This is a conversation I have already had with Kishore Maboubani. Um, I want to say that Europe never was Machiavellian in the first place. Uh, France may have been, Italy may have been, Metternich definitely was, Bismarck, uh, Richelieu. However, peace was not a European thing. Peace was brought by the Soviets, by the Americans, not by Europe itself. Um, it's the, the Marshall Plan that forms the basis of, of Europe. And three generations down, we're still living in that bubble. Et donc les Européens depuis, on en est donc à trois générations, ils vivent dans cette bulle-là en fait. Donc je souhaite énormément une évolution. Cela veut dire que dans l'état actuel de l'Europe réelle, je ne crois pas que plus d'intégration irait dans le sens que nous souhaitons. In the real Europe, I think that more integration is definitely not the way we want to go. Um, if we have more integration, that means no more veto. That means a simple vote by majority. And that would lead to a pacifist, to a more neutral Europe. Um, a Europe that would want money spent on social, on technological things, but definitely not on sovereignty. Um, and that spending would not lead to affirmation. It would lead to a large Switzerland. I have a lot of respect for Switzerland um, and what it has, it has achieved, but it's, this is not what we are thinking of when we think of Europe. Um, we need to unblock what's in the head of Germans, of French, of, of Italians, and we need to basically search for um, more efficiency, um, which is not what we would achieve with more integration. Et après, on pourra reparler de plus d'intégration avec une, une recherche d'efficacité. Mais, mais je ne le vois pas dans l'autre sens. You know, I completely agree with the historical analysis of uh, Minister Vedrin that the, the European project, the successful European project today, uh, is not a result of Machiavellian calculations, it's a result of the accident of history. Uh, it was the Soviet Union, the fear of the Soviet Union that solidified Europe in many ways and has succeeded in creating this strong European Union. I agree with the historical thing. But at the same time, uh, I think it's also uh, important to understand that when the, 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 the geopolitical circumstances that led to the successful Europe change, uh, I agree with him, will have an impact on Europe too. And for me, the biggest, I, I, as a European, the one thing 
that I would worry about 10 to 20, 30 years from now happening, by the way, is the rise of far right parties in all of Europe. And, and, and I can understand, and I, I, I sadly, I, I'm gonna make, a, I'm gonna stick my neck out and make a prediction, okay? That within Europe, uh, you will see more Donald Trump figures emerging in Europe. And the reason why more Donald Trump figures will emerge is because if the working classes, the bottom working classes, feel that their lives are getting worse and their lives are being threatened by inflows of migrants coming in and, and creating you know, a society that they feel uncomfortable with, what they do therefore is they then resort to the uh, far right. And, and there's a book out by the way, by a man called Ivan Kastev. He wrote a book called The Light That Failed that explains how uh, Hungary's Orban came about. And Orban, you must remember, is popular. <laughs> he gets elected every time. So if you, if you, don't, want, if you don't want a Europe that has uh, 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 been led by figures like Orban's and Donald Trump's, then what you have to do is to preemptively strike against that. And you strike against that by addressing the hard issues that will affect, especially the bottom 50% in, in uh, Europe and work very hard. And that's why you need the market, geopolitical Machiavellian thinking to say, hey, let's all focus on making sure that Africans don't flood into Europe and that make that the number one priority. And then you work backwards. Okay, now who do I work with on that? And you, you, you therefore you create a whole new geopolitical package. Because if you don't do that, then it'd be very sad for the world to see a Europe which is dominated by more Donald Trump figures, more urban figures. Oui, encore une fois, je suis assez d'accord avec ce qu'il dit. Et moi, je cherche le déclic. I would like to say that I agree fully with Kishore Mababani. I'm, I'm still looking for that moment when things will change. And as uh, uh, Mr. Steinmeier said, and it's even more potent if it's a German person who said it rather than the French, we are geopolitical herbivores in the geopolitical world of carnivores. Um, and so this conversation revolves exactly around this concept, how to convince Europe to become a power, to become a Pacific power, not pacifists, however, and how to develop this power within its relationship with others. Qui puisse développer les relations avec les uns et les bons. Donc on, on est vraiment sur la, sur la même ligne, en tout cas, le, avec le même objectif. Well, thank you so much for this conclusion, um, uh, Monsieur le Ministre Hubert Vedrine. Um, how do we make sure Europe um, moves away from being a vegetarian, maybe even a prey to carnivore in the future? And how this plays out with the rivalry between the United States and, and China? I think it was a fascinating overview of the history, the geography, the politics, which will be impacting that tension over the next few years. Thank you so much for both of you. And uh, to our listeners, we'll see you next week. So the episode with uh, Kishore Mabubani and, and Hubert Vedrin is, is over. What do you think of what do you think of it, uh, François? Well, it's really great. I'm so happy we're able to have both of them with us. And also a special thanks to Axel Oxborough who translated Hubert Vedrin to, to English. Um, I thought it was interesting to get both of their perspectives on this because first of all, Kishore Mabubani's book is um, thought provoking. Um, he he He's in a China hawk. Uh, I think that's that much is clear. But his book is very interesting and kind of understands a lot of the mistakes both America but also China have made, which locked them into this great power competition. Um, one of the most fascinating chapters I thought in his book was actually the first chapter where he um, talks about how China uh, was completely blindsided when Trump started his major trade war against China they thought they would have, you know, um, American businesses, American civil society, which would push back. But in fact, American businesses and pretty much all the American uh, elites ended up backing Trump against China in this trade war. And this is when they realized they had kind of overstepped in which they realized that American businesses were um, getting the short end of the deal uh, on intellectual property, 
uh, on in, uh, industrial espionage and all these different areas which had been major sources of tensions for American businesses for, for, for market access was just too important. And when Trump all of a sudden had this kind of I am Spartacus moment, everyone kind of rallied around it. And I think the, Chi the, the Chinese were very much blindsided by this and this was a, the main strategic mistake. Um, he does say that on the flip side, America does not have a kind of strategic vision of what he wants to do with its uh, uh, with China as kind of a general uh, drive towards containing China, but there is no kind of grand strategy. And he actually quotes Henry Kissinger on, on this saying, there's no kind of American grand strategy on how to contain China. So a very thought provoking book. And what I think is important when talking about Europe and what Europe should do is the very first question we asked them is, Essentially, is China 1950s USSR? In which case, if China is 1950s USSR, there is no, no conversation to be had. Because in which case, you know, rally around the Americans, um, stand up for democracy, uh, liberal values, and end of the conversation. However, what I think is, is, is clear from, from both of them is that China, with its, all its flaws and uh, all its might, is not 1950s USSR. It, ha it has an agenda but it's not a revolutionary force like 1950s USSR under Stalin was, which wanted to spread um, uh, communism internationally for a kind of a grand international proletarian revolution. So once once we've agreed on that, I think Europe has more leeway because if it was, again, if it was uh, this kind of international threat that Nazi Germany or Soviet, Soviet Union was, then there'd be no conversation. Yeah, I think, I think this is precisely the, the dilemma that we're facing uh, in all the countries in the West that are, uh, that are grappling with the rise of China is, is to what extent this, uh, this alters the, the, um, the world order, right? What, what, kind of, what kind of power China is? Is it, is it a, a power that seeks to, to peacefully cohabit with other powers or, or is it seeking to fundamentally alter the um, uh, you know, access to the world commons, the way that... Uh, rules are the, the way that rules are made to govern commerce and uh, uh, you know and trade. Uh, the way that the way that technology um, you know is is um, is procured by by states and, and private actors and and um, and the, the 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 sort of argument that you get from the Americans and particularly the sort of the hawkish right, I think uh, you know isn't hasn't really uh, hasn't really stuck with with a European audience. Right, this idea that China is a fundamental threat. That China is working to impress its uh, societal regime on on other countries. That it's a sort of almost imperialist power, where you know if China comes and sets up a university campus in your country, then they're they're necessarily uh, going to embed spies that are gonna they're gonna you know uh, uh, red pill your your political elites into believing China is a friendly nation, or that they're gonna demand that you. Uh, that you um, that you block some sort of statement against uh, the abuses in Hong Kong or, or in Xinjiang. That it's this sort of very nefarious influence on geopolitics. And and I think the what was interesting in the conversation is that uh, it, it really was a, a point of agreement between Hubert Vedrin and Kishore Mabubani that uh, that the sort of um, maximalist view of, of the Chinese threat um, doesn't really doesn't really hold water, at least uh, from the viewpoint of, of a European audience, and certainly not from from uh, the viewpoint of European diplomats, uh, who were, for the most part, working to uh, balance, uh, you know, and, and it, this was one of the questions that you drafted: is, is, uh, you know, whether China's rise is, is an opportunity for, uh, for Western Europe to, um, to balance out its its relationship with, uh, with, with, uh, with the United States, and and if you take the sort of uh, knee jerk uh, Atlanticist view, uh, such as is my case. Um, you know, you, you don't want to. You don't want that sort of balancing act to be to be uh, Europe's foreign policy. You want you want Europe to be um, to be uh, to be in principle, you know, uh, uh, a Western block, right? Uh, a block that you know that foregrounds values as part of its foreign policy. And and I certainly think that that um, that uh, Chinese behavior is a, is a is a huge concern, and we've got to be you know using sort of hard power tools to 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 confront China. Uh, but I think that the, the way that diplomats uh, in Europe are, are facing up to this, uh, as, as crystallized by the, by uh, Hubert Vedrin and, and his comments, is, is totally uh, is, is a lot more pragmatic, uh, right? I mean, and I, I really enjoyed, in fact, at the very start of the conversation, how both of them 
uh, took the view that China is playing the long game. China is not pressured by history. China knows that it's got demographics on its side, even technology on its side. It knows that. Um, but but I, I, the, the one thing, and I'll, I'll end with this, the, the one thing that I thought both of them overlooked is to what extent China is changing under Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping, certainly, there, there's been a whole lot of commentary in the, the sort of the national security establishment of the states and all of the major foreign policy magazines have been heavily writing on this issue, that Xi Jinping has a fundamental uh, vision for China's global role. And it's a vision that is a lot more hard edged. It's, it's um, you know, he certainly has a vision of China reclaiming a central role in, in the world order. Uh, and even, uh, and even, um, uh, you know, and even um, uh, getting, getting its, um, getting its, uh, you know, when I, when I say sort of, uh, it, 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 there, there's almost like a victimhood mentality. Uh, when you listen to the to, to the kind of the elites that that surround Xi Jinping and his his official um, rhetoric is one that says you know China was was a was a, under Western domination for much of the 20th century, and yet now we have uh, all of the engines of economic growth, demographic growth, technological advancement on our on our side. We've got wind on our sails, so to speak, and now it's this is China's time to rise and to shine, and uh, the Western powers that are uh, the Western powers that are talking about values, uh, they just use that as a uh, self-interested cop-out uh, to keep us from from uh, from from rising, right? To to sort of keep keep our head on underwater and and and, and constrain our our emergence. Uh, so I, I thought that both both guests actually sort of overlooked um, some of some of what the the rhetoric of Xi Jinping actually shows. And this is this is a major pivot. I think you know China experts have. Spent a lot of time pointing to this, and it's you know it's it's conventional wisdom at this point that that Xi Jinping is a more authoritarian leader domestically certainly, and he's he's also incredibly more assertive by by Chinese standards. He's no this is no longer Deng Xiaoping's uh, peaceful peaceful uh, rise or rise. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, you talked a little bit about history, and I think it's important to understand that. Not just from the Chinese perspective, but kind of objectively, China, with rare exceptions, has always been a at least a regional superpower, if not a global superpower. It's something that is quite clear. There's throughout Chinese history, there's moments of uh, strife, internal divisions, where the country is completely inward looking and in, in, in fighting. But then there are moments where it is a humongous power, not just militarily, but culturally, and all the rest of the region is subservient to Chinese whims because it is just that powerful in the region. Now, it does not mean it had troubled relations with, with, with Vietnam, with, with Mongolia, with, with Korea, but it's just the superpower. And the 19th and 20th century, in that sense, are a bit of an anomaly because China, which, you know, if you look at kind of historically the GDP of, of world GDP, China always had uh, 20 to 50 percent of it. And kind of only exception is uh, 19th, 20th century. So there's a return to a form of normalcy. But in, in the meantime, there's a global global order which had been established. So China, China is rising and China finds its place. So automatically that's going to create tensions. Then there's also the issue of Xi Jinping, and I agree, that adds another layer of, of conflictuality. Um, we didn't get to talk much about the, um, what was going on in, in Xinjiang and in Hong Kong. Um, but that, that, I think, is, is because there's one thing if China is becoming a more assertive power, uh, using its, uh, its, its muscles to uh, gain influence and positioning in the South China Sea, for example. What is going on in Xinjiang is, is, is another matter entirely. And, um, and, you know, when you read it, I, I usually hate comparing anything with the 1930s. I think I've already made that point a few times in the podcast. But... I remember reading how how people were late in the 1930s Germany built the, the concentration camp. Now, I'm not saying what's going on in China is comparable to what is going on in, in Nazi Germany, but it is somewhat similar. And and now I understand why people people let it have in Germany. It's because um, what can realistically Europeans do? I mean, we've been pressuring, we've been doing things here and there, and I think, I think the Chinese are receptive to this because I understand it's very bad PR at, at, at minimum. And so apparently they're now thinking about uh, tuning a bit their, their methods there. But it's a very, very difficult issue. And, and, and to be honest, as long as there's a, this kind of major issue in Xinjiang, I'm not quite sure how we can have a perfectly normal relation. 
Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that's that's what you're seeing uh, with um, you know I mean certainly the the um, the idea of centralizing foreign policy making in uh, in in sort of at the supranational level where it's not always the result of the uh, unanimous consent of the 27 member states, but you have a, sort of a permanent bureaucracy and, and even a shift towards uh, qualified uh, majority voting, which is where uh, uh, Germany admittedly wants to, wants to take this uh, the system. It, it doesn't want the smaller nations to be able to block statements in, on Hong Kong, say, as, as was the case in Hungary a few weeks ago. It wants to have a more, a more um, nimble uh, regime of, of uh, decision making in that the, sort of the highest higher spheres of uh, the, the council, the EU, and, and so on. So, um, so that w what you're seeing with the shift is not uh, it, it, it doesn't run par it, it doesn't necessarily um, equate with uh, a tougher stance on China. In fact, you know, we 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 had an episode about the uh, the investment agreement with with China, and as opaque as that deal was. Uh, it, it certainly you, you can't say that uh, the fact that it it uh, it didn't have to go through all the motions of the, you know, the 27 member states voting for it that didn't make it tougher on China quite quite to the contrary it, it was um, it was kept under wraps from for, for, I, I will say one thing America has a tough rhetoric on China but it is the EU which has ended its agreement investment agreement with with China. Whereas the U.S., which basically has exactly the same terms with China, is maintaining that agreement. So you know, there's a bit, there's a bit of a um, cognitive dissonance there, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure the Biden administration will 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 be forceful on China and whatnot. But in in the meantime, it is Europe that has done the, the heavy lifting. Yeah. Well, and, and the, uh, the 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 more problematic aspect of that deal, this the comprehensive agreement on investment, was was the was that was that it was rushed. Was that it came at you know the worst possible time when uh, you know an administration was waiting to be sworn in, into office. Uh, Joe Biden wasn't even uh, wasn't even able to sort of uh, you know adjust his China strategy to to um you know to the to the reality of Europe having an investment agreement and and um, no I, I think no I, to I totally take uh, uh, Minister of Adrien's point you know although although I think I I, I don't think that either a uh, supranational uh, more supranational way of making decisions, or or one that um, that retains power at the national at the nation state level. I'm not sure that either of those uh, either of those uh, uh, modes uh, can be uh, can be equated to a tougher or or a softer uh, position in China. I think at the end of the day, it all depends on you know how you know we've seen that it's also a very sort of corporate uh, driven uh, foreign policy. You know specifically is it relates to, 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 to investment and trade so I, I um I don't know what the solution is I think from from I think it's going to take a lot more um, you know sort of unsafe unsavory behavior from China a lot of uh, you know a lot of new uh, press reports to come out of Xinjiang and a lot of uh, cracking down on on Hong Kong's democracy for uh, for the uh, for the European public and the European elites to uh, uh, to change their views on China, I think the general trend is, is towards uh, accommodation, despite despite you know the, the grandstanding of the rhetoric. I think that's where we're headed in, in Europe, at least. And well, thanks, Jorge, and thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Ministre Vedrin, to um, Ambassador and Professor Kishore Mabani, and to Axel Oxboro, who translated um, Uber for this conversation. We are so glad to be able to have these conversations, and we hope this is going to be. Uh, the first of many with um, with uh, intellectuals and uh, of Europe and outside of Europe to kind of understand where China, where Europe stands in this great competition between the US and, and China. Thank you so much again. If you come to us every week, you can show your support with small things, you know, like uh, subscribing, writing a review, uh, liking, sharing with a friend. All these small things really help the show continue to grow. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, and see you all next week. See you next week.